I'm going to start by saying this morning that we are a Bible-believing church. Yes. Amen. It's the heartbeat of our church. And, you know, we think about it, it's how we know God, the inspired Word of God. It's perfect, and it is preserved, and it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's what I believe. It's what you believe. It's why we're here this morning, the Bible, the Word of God. I recently talked to a younger man. And we were talking about Bible doctrine. You think about the word doctrine. Doctrine is what you believe. We have Bible doctrine because we believe what the Bible says. And we were talking about a certain subject. And I asked him, what do you believe about this subject? And he began to quote, well, so-and-so said. And he began to go in a long line of what this other man said about what he believed. And I said, have you ever looked what the Bible says? And it was like his eyes went like this. It was like a deer in a headlight. I never thought about it like that. But that's what we're here. We're Bible-believing people. We believe, thus saith the Lord. We have our answers from the Word of God. That's a good thing, isn't it? Amen. Now take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This is probably our sixth week in uh, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was in the region of Galilee. He went around and you know how Jesus, he, he makes a difference. Amen. Healed people, ministered unto people, encouraged people, taught people, and people began to flock to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what they did. He called his disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And you see the disciples following him, the multitude following him. I hope that if I had lived at that time, if I heard that Jesus was around, I would go out and follow him too. Amen. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, at Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he got a little bit north of the Sea of Galilee, went up into the mountain. The multitude begins to gather around him, his disciples, and he began to teach them. And first of all, in Matthew chapter 5, he taught them how to be blessed. And I preached a message on uh, being blessed. And blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then he talked and gave an important message. Ye are the salt of the earth. And we looked at last week, if you remember, Matthew chapter 6. He looked at a group of people who struggled in their prayer life. And he taught them how to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Not the end of the sermon yet. Amen. Uh, many of you heard that sermon last week and you spent this last week taking that seven uh, day challenge about praying. And I've had a lot of good reports about your prayer life being changed. Praise God for that. Now, he continues on in this portion of Scripture, in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse number 19. He begins to deal with verse number 19 all the way to the end of the chapter with something you and I, really, we deal with. A problem that we deal with, something that consumes our mind and our life, our thoughts, often more than it should but something that sometimes we're worried about, and it's called our finances. We begin to worry about our finances. How are we going to make our ends meet? How are we going to have food? How are we going to have clothing? How are we going to have a place to live? And we worry about finances. This is really a two-part message. I'm going to take the next two weeks and deal right here the rest of Matthew chapter 6. This is part number one of our two-part sermon. If you can stand with me for the reading of God's word. We're going to start reading at verse number 19. And we're going to read through verse 24. What I'll do is I'll read verse number 19. We'll read every other verse until verse number 24. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, 
for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Oh, finances, treasure in heaven, treasure in earth. No man can serve two masters. And really, we think about it. We begin to make decisions today. Who are we going to serve? Who is our God? Is our God the God of the Bible? Amen. That's, that's the right choice. Or is our God the dollar bill? Somebody could call it the almighty dollar bill. And Jesus makes that choice for us. He says, hey, our God should be the true and living God, the God of the Bible. Amen. And we all have to make that choice. Who are you going to serve? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. And it's been a good morning. We thank you, Lord, for us. I love the spirit of our church. We're imperfect people rallying around you, serving you the perfect God. And God, thank you for working in the hearts and the minds this morning. Boy, uh, the opportunity we have to come together, sing the songs of you, Lord, fellowship, and then hear the preaching of your word. Help us this morning to decrease. Help me to decrease, you to increase. And Lord, we may not outwardly say we battle in this area, but many, if I could say probably most do. And Lord, I pray that you help us to see how we need to decrease in our own ways and begin to acknowledge you, and you will direct our path, and you are a God that will take care of us. We love you, Lord. We do need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The angels were assembled before the throne singing songs of worship to the lord alone as they cried holy holy the heavens filled with glory but they had to step aside when they heard a song arise it made the father smile to see his child step forth and start to sing Redeemed, I am redeemed, the greatest song this mortal tongue can sing. Redeemed, I am redeemed, I once was lost but now I'm found, His love has turned my life around. Saved a wretch like me, I am redeemed. The saints were all assembled there in praise. The choir was softly singing, every hand was raised. The preacher made his final plea to every heart that would believe. Then a hush fell on that place When a sinner felt his grace The saints and angels did rejoice When that child began to lift his voice Redeemed, I am redeemed The greatest song this mortal tongue can sing Redeemed, I am redeemed. I once was lost, but now I'm found. His love has turned my life around. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. I am redeemed, I am redeemed. song this mortal tongue can sing. Redeemed, I am redeemed. I once was lost, but now I'm found. His love has turned my life around. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. 
I am redeemed. Amen. Oh, so many people are burdened, not by the spiritual demands of life, praying, reading your Bible, raising your family for the Lord, uh, going to church, but they're distracted by secular distractions of accumulating riches. And often their desire for material things is strong. Sometimes it is very subtle. Uh, they desire material things. We live in a material world surrounded by material things. We have to handle the material part of life, but uh, the answer sometimes for all of us seems like the answer is to acquire wealth, acquire money. And uh, sometimes if we're not careful, we can be very distracted by money and certain choices we begin to make based on money lead us down the wrong path. By the way, before we go any further, money is not evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some having coveted after, have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. By the way, because you're rich doesn't mean you're not right with God. Sometimes God chooses when you do his will to give people extra money, but often he doesn't. So money's not the root of all these, but making decisions. The end you'll see the making of decisions based on money, not on the will of God, is where people get in trouble. Amen? Amen. And uh, we begin to think about that. And I want to think about Sermon on the Mount. Jesus in the region of Galilee begins to travel around, heal people, encourage people. Uh, he begins to teach people. The multitudes begin to throng. The disciples are called. He goes up into the mountain. Oh, hallelujah. I made it up here. I made it up here. Amen. Amen. He goes up in a mountain. The multitudes are gathering around him. And if you can picture, I was trying to picture the Lord Jesus Christ up on that mountain. And he sees people. These are individual people, individual lives, and their, their lives matter to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like you. You matter to the Lord Jesus Christ. I matter to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He loves me. He's got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. He's on that mountain and sees different people. And I sort of made a list of different people I imagined the Lord seeing. I imagined him seeing a farmer, a chariot maker, a priest, a carpenter, a blind beggar, a fisherman, a tax collector, a transportation service driver, a camel driver, amen, a thief and a robber, and many ladies who uh, were there as housewives and helpers of their husband. And he saw all these different people. And imagine Jesus looks out and he sees back there in the back a farmer. And imagine the farmer, he has got, he's listening to Jesus teach. He has pressures in life. And imagine maybe that farmer the year before had planted a crop and things were going well. The crop was growing. Imagine a storm coming through. It begins to hail and it takes in and knocks out his crop. He has bills to pay. He has seed to buy. And imagine him financially almost ruined two years ago. And he begins to worry. He begins to think about it. You know, I've got to borrow money to buy seed this year. I may never get caught up. And you can almost see the farmer man in the back of his mind saying sometimes, if only I was rich, if I could only get a hold of some treasure, all of my problems would be over. Imagine the chariot maker. Chariot maker, he, he designs and makes chariots and he sells the chariot when it's finished. And imagine him as he's making this chariot, when he finishes it, he's gonna get paid. But imagine as he's making it, a, a hardship comes in life. He spends some money on the old fashioned 2000 uh, year old credit card, amen. And he knows when he gets done, he'll be able to pay for it. But then another thing happens and another thing happens. And he knows as soon as he's done with making that chariot, he sells it only to pay his bills. So then he tries to do two at once. He's staying up late at night, getting up early in the morning. And he begins to think in the back of his mind, oh, if only I was rich, if only I could get a hold of some treasure, all my problems would be over. 
Imagine the priest, the priest, and you know the uh, region of Galilee had many synagogues around there, and there were priests, and they took care of people's problems, and I believe some of those priests were very sincere, but imagine the pressure of the priest. He, he tries to help people with their problems and their difficulties, and he tries to point them to the Word of God, and uh, you know, the priest begins to get overwhelmed with other people's problems, and sometimes he thinks, you know, if I could just go live out in the country away from the problemless world, if only I had some money so I could get away. If only I was rich. If only I could get a hold of some treasure. All of my problems are over. By the way, if we can get through this first part, it'll help us with the rest of the sermon. So bear with me for a moment, okay? I know some of you I can't see, and that's probably a good thing. And uh, praise the Lord. Uh, it's good. Now, think about the carpenter. A carpenter. Yeah, he's the construction worker. He's struggling. He's helping build houses, fix doors. And imagine the constructor. He's got so much business, he's having a hard time finding good helpers. And uh, he also struggles. He works hard. He invests his lumber, his time, his effort into getting a job done. And at the end of the job, the person he did the job for is broke and can't pay it. And he's got employees to pay. And uh, then all of a sudden he does another job and his construction workers work on the wrong part of the fence and he gets done with the job and he begins to notice that he did the wrong fence and he has to rip out the old fence and he begins to think if only I was rich and if I could only could get a hold of some treasure all of my problems would be over uh, imagine back in the back way back there there's a, a blind beggar he's been blind from birth and every day he goes out to the same street corner and he's calling out. He can't see anybody, but he hears sometimes those people who mock him, who, hey, you out here again, Mr. Blind Man? Ha, 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 you can't see me. And they'll sometimes come poke him in the side and he can't get him quick enough. And every year it's, a, it's an emotional battle. And the blind man begins to think, you know, I'm blind. I can't fix that. But if only I could have some riches, some treasure, that would solve all of my problems. The fisherman, you ever thought about fishing? Oh, the fisherman goes up, he toils all night, catches nothing, he's doing it for a business. Then he goes out the next night, he finds the hot spot. He finds the, the fish, he begins to bring those fish in and his net breaks and he loses them all. He goes back in, he mends his net, he goes back out to the hot spot again, gonna catch those fish, only to find out there's no fish there. And then he comes out and he sees all the other fishermen. They got their fish and finally goes out and catches a few, tries to sell them. But the price of fish, normally a dollar a pound, is now 25 cents a pound because of all the other fishermen have all these fish. And he begins to think, if only I had some wealth, some treasure, all of my problems would be solved. The tax collector, oh, everybody hates him. He's the guy that puts the taxes on the chariots, you know, or the camels and the camel tax, the chariot tax. And once a year, the bill in the mail, he's got to be the one that delivers them. And, you know, the tax collector, nobody likes the tax collector, do they? Amen. Amen. And uh, so he's the one that's hated. And he begins to think, if I only I could uh, have some wealth, some riches, I could quit being a tax collector and everybody wouldn't hate us. The transportation driver, the guy who drives from the region of Galilee all the way to Jerusalem, and uh, he has problems with his camel. Uh, the camel loses his shoe, and he's limping the rest of the way, so he's got to get him re -shoed. He gets robbed by the robbers, and he begins to be away from his family and his home. He begins to think, boy, this is not what I expected out of life. If only I could have some riches, all of my problems would be over. The thief and the robber. Hey, the thief and the robber came to hear Jesus too. They know what they're doing is wrong. They know that there's a good possibility one day they'll get caught. They'll get, they'll get killed for what they've done. But they come and they begin to think, boy, if just uh, I could get a hold of some wealth, I could quit my thieving and robbering and all my problems would be over. Uh, you think about some of the, maybe a woman, she is a, a housewife and taking care of her husband, but she sees over at some of the other people on the other side of the town that have all the nice clothes, all the nice food. She toils and works and works and toils. She begins to think, only if I had more money, I wouldn't have to work so hard. If only I had some treasure. By the way, can I just say that's a much like it is for us? It, it really is. Now, we, we, we labored through that first part. I understand that. But can I just say, that is much like we are today. Right. We, we live in a society that tells us that the answer for all of our problems is money, treasure. We're trained. How do you know that? Well, go to 7-Eleven. You ever been to 7-Eleven and not seen somebody buying lottery tickets? 
They're buying lottery tickets. Why? Because the answer for all the problems is money. And, and we think about it. Have you ever noticed all the get-rich-quick schemes there are in the world? It's always been. There's always been get-rich-quick schemes. Hey, because, hey, money is the answer to all of your problems. Well, I, I found this. This was in an 1875 newspaper, and it was an advertisement in what they call the Geographical Review showing uh, how it was in the 1800s. Not much different today. It starts like this. It says, glorious opportunity to get rich. Now, I'm going to continue reading, okay? I'm going to start over again because glorious, if some of you, your eyes shot up like that, you're like, sign me up, pastor, right there. That's why I'm preaching this sermon, okay? Uh, a glorious opportunity to get rich. We're starting a cat ranch in Layton with 10,000 cats. Each cat will average 12 kittens a year. The cat skins will sell for 30 cents each. 100 men can skin 5,000 cats a day. We figure a daily profit of over $10,000. Now, now what shall we feed the cats? We will start a rat ranch next door with 1 million rats. The rats will breed 12 times faster than the cats, so we'll have to have four cats to feed e or four rats to feed each cat each day. Now, what shall we feed the rats? We will feed the rats the carcasses of the cats after they've been skinned. Now get this. We feed the rats to the cats and the cats to the rats and we get the skins for nothing. Real advertisement. And you know, some people read that and they went, ooh, I'm a part of that right there. I'm going to get me a cat and rat ranch and I'm going to be rich, gloriously rich. And we think that money will solve all of our problems. Jesus saw that. He, he sees that behind your eyes, and it sees in your brain that some of you in your mind, you think the answer to all of your problems is treasure this side of eternity. So go back with the Bible with me. Look at verse number 19. Look at this. Verse number 19. Jesus says to this crowd, he says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself, yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Read verse 21 with me. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In the Bible times, much of what was treasures was in the form of fabrics. You think about the purple fabric and the fine twined linen. And you think about that uh, alongside the word, word fabric, or that, that thought is uh, a moth, moth-eaten fabric. Moth would come and devour the fabric, eat the fabric, ruin that treasured commodity of a fabric. Uh, you think about costly metal, and alongside that costly metal, rust, and their precious metal would be rusted. Then you think about people taking their treasures and hiding them. Uh, finding a secure place for them, but even back then they had thieves that would come in and uh, steal that which you have laid up. And Jesus is looking at them and he says, hey, we need to be careful about accumulating earthly treasures that uh, rots, that rusts, or that gets robbed. And he's saying, be careful of those earthly treasures because the end of those earthly troubles is, uh, you think about it, it rots, it rusts, and it gets robbed. Laying up treasure is a desire we all have. Did I say that? Yes. And the Lord knew that inside of us, we have desires for riches. And he lays down a truth, a needed truth. And that desire of laying up treasures is not necessarily bad if put in the right place. Because you can lay up treasures. And he's saying lay up treasures, but don't do it down here. Do it up there. Right. You understand that? Right. Go ahead and lay up treasures, but lay up treasures up there, and heavenly treasures. And by the way, this is a theme of the Bible. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If, we then, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. That's a good verse, isn't it? Uh, John chapter 14, you, you remember that. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will uh, come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But he's given a picture of heaven. Hey, heavenly treasures are good. Don't lay up treasures down here. Lay up treasures up there. Revelation chapter 21. You ever read that? That's the second to last chapter in the Bible. It describes the uh, new Jerusalem. And uh, I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. This is the description. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Then it gives an even greater description later on the trap. Woo, it's a glorious place. And Jesus is saying over and over again, don't lay up treasures down here where moth, rust, and uh, thieves come in and steal, but go ahead and lay up treasures. Think about the etern what's eternity in view. Imagine with me real quick. Imagine an elderly lady. She lives for the Lord. Sometimes she's even misunderstood by her own family. She tells people about Jesus. She's faithful to church. She reads her Bible a lot. I mean, a lot. She controls her emotions. She doesn't get caught up in the riches of this world. Uh, some call her poor, but she sees it a different way. See, sometimes we'll have, see an offering at the church, and she'll give more than she you know, a lot of people say she probably could more. She'd sacrifice even to the point where it seems like it's hurting her, but she still gives anyway, and she's rich in the Lord. Imagine it, years go by, she passes away. Just imagine her, that elderly old lady, she dies. She wakes up. She's in eternity. Woo! Glory! There's a shout. There's a land, praise God I did. Man, praise God that I focused this side. Boy, she bows her knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords. She takes her crowns and lays them at the feet of Jesus right there. But she is rich toward the Lord. She's rich up in heaven. And it is glorious. Amen. By the way, the world indoctrinates us. Indoctrinates us with the idea that earthly riches, materialism, is so wonderful and so good. Boy, indoctrinate, does it not? It indoctrinates that we're earthly riches are what you desire and what you want. I, I remember I grew up, and in the 1980s, uh, in Council Bluffs, Iowa, my parents were on a bowling league. You ever been on a bowling league? And so the bowling league, mm, you know, whoa, that was close. That was close right there. Uh, bowling league. How many ever bowling leagues, parents in a bowling league, or anybody in a bowling league? Okay, it used to be a big thing. You know what I did at senior in high school? Senior in high school, my first class for the whole year was bowling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that, was, that was interesting. So we went to the bowling alley every day for bowling class. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, but I went to the bowling alley with my parents. And imagine a kid in a bowling alley. They had video games, an arcade. They had pool tables. Then they had this jukebox. And I specifically remember the jukebox. The jukebox would play a, a certain song. And at that period of time, I remember a song that I learned uh, back then in the day, in the 80s, that was on that jukebox that played over and over and over. And here's the beginning of the lyrics. And probably some of you know this song. If you don't know it, you'll know it, uh, you'll remember this. But this is from the 80s. Here we go. Some boys kiss me. Some boys hug me. I think they're okay. If they don't give me a proper credit, I just walk away. They can beg and they can plead, but they can't see the light. That's right. Because the boy with the cold, hard cash is always Mr. Right. Do you know that song? Okay. Well, now you'll know it. Maybe. Well, you shouldn't know this, but if you know it, because we're living in a material world, and I'm a material girl. You know that we're living in a material world, and I'm just a material girl. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about now. You've been corrupted just like I was corrupted years ago. But what, what was preached, what she was saying, is God doesn't matter. The Bible doesn't matter. All that matter. It doesn't matter if it's a nice guy. It doesn't matter if the man's faithful to me. All that matters, Mr. Wright has the big bucks. That's all I'm looking for. That'll solve all my problems. She's wrong, by the way. But it is a doctrine that is preached, earthly treasures, earthly treasures, earthly treasures. Another man, do you remember another man named Steve Jobs? You ever heard of Steve Jobs? 
Maybe you haven't, but back in the day, in the late, late 1970s, him and another man named Steve Wozniak started what they call the Apple Computer Company. And uh, Steve Wozniak was the, the guy behind the actual technical side, and Steve Jobs was the salesman, you might say. And you remember maybe in, in school or your parents had a, an Apple IIe computer. Do you remember that? And uh, then the Macintosh computer, the actual mouse came out. And boy, Steve Jobs made millions and millions of dollars. Then uh, Steve Jobs left the company and uh, the Apple computer went down into uh, a lull. And eventually in the late 90s, Steve Jobs came back to Apple computer to rejuvenate it. They came out with the iMac. And you remember the late 1990s, the iMac. Then they came out with the iPod. You remember the iPod? Boy, it began to, to bring back Apple life. Then back in the really 2009, 2010, they came out with a thing called the iPhone and the iPad. And Steve Jobs, you remember Steve? He's a billionaire. This side of eternity. Uh, many people want to be just like Steve Jobs. They dress like Steve Jobs. They study his business model. Steve Jobs, by the way, was a non-believer in the God of the Bible. Right. Steve Jobs was a Zen Buddhist, born in February the 24th, 1955. He died on October the 5th, 2011. And by the way, prematurely, he was a young man, actually. And imagine Steve Jobs for a moment. He dies. He passes into eternity. He all of a sudden stands before the Lord. And the Lord looks at him and says, Depart from me, I never knew thee, into everlasting flames of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But, 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 I'm Steve Jobs, depart from me. I'll give you a million dollars, a billion dollars, depart from me. But, it doesn't matter, depart from me. Right, right, right. And you think about him in hell, burning for all of eternity. His earthly treasure can do nothing for him. It was a waste. Well, I'm Steve Jobs. Yeah, praise God I'm not. Amen. Praise God I'm not. Boy, and by the way, some of you might be tempted to say that I'm exaggerating this morning. And I want to say that I'm not. And biblically, I can show you that because there's another story in the Bible similar to that in Luke chapter 16. I'm going to read it to you. Uh, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and, des and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, the rich man in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, rememberest that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. You think about that, treasures in heaven or treasures on earth? Some choose treasures on earth, set their mind. The answer is treasures on earth. The answer is those treasures on earth. Hey, whether you're a carpenter or you're that camel rider or you're that beggar or you're that housewife, hey, sometimes we're tempted to believe the answer is, I, you, by the way, you wonder why I keep doing this today. I used to have hair up here, okay? So just see, I'm just see a shiny mirror today. See that right there? And that's why I keep doing that because I'm missing something. I feel lighter in my feet this morning. And uh, treasures in heaven or treasures on earth. We have that temptation. Let me just say the answer is treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. Treasures in heaven. If I get one more amen, I'll move on. Treasures in heaven. Amen. Good. Now look back with me at verse number 22. Chapter 6, verse 20. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, the, the Lord right here, as you read this, he enlarged his teaching about treasure, and he draw, draw, drew our attention to our eyes. In other words, he was saying, hey, be careful what you look at. Be careful, you know, the, the brain, when you begin to look at something, think about something, you begin to muse on something, it starts with your eyes. You look at something, you look at something. You know, in the Bible, for example, would be David. Do you remember David? He was to go forth to battle. He stayed home. He's on that castle. And before he ever committed that sin of adultery and that sin of murder, he began to look with his eyes at the wrong thing. And Jesus is saying, be careful what you do with your eyes. Be careful what you're looking at. Because what you begin to look at is what you begin to think about. And what you begin to think about is what you end up doing. What are you looking at? Uh, another way to explain this, and by the way, this is not sinful. I remember uh, growing up, I was in Iowa. And uh, we're growing up. And my dad had a video game system called the Intellivision. Amen. Anybody else ever have the Intellivision? Brother Bosha? Uh, Sister Sue, you did? Oh my. Your brother did. Oh, it wasn't you. It wasn't you. Okay, we had the Intellivision. We had the Intellivision, and uh, we were watching a television program probably about 8 o'clock at night, and all of a sudden the commercial came on. And it was for the Intellivision Burger Time video game. Oh, yeah. And you ever heard of Burger Time, the video game Burger Time? It's where you walk across hamburgers, you try to make hamburgers, and there's a funny little thing on it. And my dad, he got up. And, I mean, his eye saw a Burger Time video game, and my dad couldn't concentrate on anything. He loaded up the fan. He said, we got to go. We got to go now. We loaded up in the car. We drove down Broadway, crossed the bridge to the other side of the town. It was on the, uh, the uh, western side of Council Bluffs. There was a Kmart. And we got there really close. It was closing at 9 o'clock. We got there. And just as he was running up the door, I remember picture, my dad walking up, and he tried to get into the Kmart, and the guy had just locked the door. And my dad, he started, hey, you're not closed yet. It's not 9 o'clock. Let me in. Scared the guy half to death. He opened up, and my dad ran in, and he got Burger Time, the video game, and he came home and played. But his eye affected what ended up happening. And by the way, that's important. What are you looking at? When you begin to look and you dwell on things, the rats and the cats begin to sound good. Be careful what you're looking at. Be careful that your eye... Hey, in other words, you're going to see that you got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Amen. Keep your eyes not on earthly things, but keep your eyes in heavenly things and treasures up in heaven. Your eye affects your heart. Now, it's interesting. Remember, there was a show... I, I haven't seen it since I was a kid... But it was a show I watched as a kid. It was uh, actually a movie. It's called Alice in Wonderland. You ever seen that? Alice in Wonderland. By the way, let's not get our doctrine from some cartoon, even if it's a Disney cartoon, okay? Can I say that? Right. But Alice in Wonderland, and I read this about it. It said, in Alice in Wonderland, at one point, Alice said, said to the Cheshire cat, here's what Alice said, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? The Cheshire cat said, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice said, I don't much care where. Think about those words. I don't much care where. Then the cat said, then it doesn't matter which way you go. Right. Now think with me. If you don't care whether you go, then this sermon doesn't matter. Yeah, right. But if you care, this sermon matters immensely. It matters for your life this side of eternity. And vitally, vitally important. Do you care? If you care, watch what you're looking at. Right. Watch what you're looking at. Because you begin to be that, that uh, carpenter that was there thinking, boy, the answer is money. The answer is money. You take the Lord out of the equation. The answer is the Lord. Boy, the fisherman, yes, he has struggles. Yes, he has different things. But he's got to remember, hey, my God shall, he, God, God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. By the way, I'm getting a little bit ahead to next week's sermon. But God is the answer. God is the answer. God is the answer. Amen. Amen. Now go back with me to the Bible to verse number 24. Because God puts it sort of on its decision time. And you can see Jesus looking out and he, he tells the people, verse 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, money right there. He says either one or the other. It can't be both. It's impossible to have two masters, for you have to choose which one you will serve. Remember, the, the battle is, is there throughout the Bible. Remember Jonah? Do you remember Jonah? God's will for his life. Go to Nineveh. I don't want to. Go to Nineveh. I don't have to. He begins to run from the will of God. Now, did running from the will of God make him happy? No, it made him miserable. Got thrown out of the ship, uh, swallowed by a whale, and you read Jonah chapter 2, and he describes that whale belly as being in the depths of hell. It was bad. By the way, getting out of the will of the Lord, it doesn't make your life happier. It makes you miserable. So who are you going to choose to be your God? Who are you choosing to be God? You think about it. Nobody can serve two masters. Either you choose to serve the God of the Bible, Amen. or you choose to serve the God money. Sometimes you hear people call this the almighty dollar bill. But can I just tell you, it's not almighty. It is a necessary evil. I'm not saying money. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money is. And so when we begin to make decisions based on money, all of a sudden we've got a bad thing. We, we need to make our decisions based on what is the will of the Lord. And we begin to think, God, what is your will in my life? What is your will for this decision? What is your will in this? Hey, God, I'm struggling in my fishing business. What can I do? Show me what you desire me to do. And then if you submit to what the Lord wants you to do, you're going to be okay. But if all of a sudden you take God out of the equation, you begin to say, hey, I, I saw an article written about how I can skin cats and, and have a rat farm right there. It's very easy, amen, to get out of the will of the Lord. Who are you choosing to be your God? Many choose the, the uh, dollar bill. It seems wonderful sometimes, but there's a price to be paid. You cannot serve God and mammon. This is read out here. Remember uh, years ago, but this years ago, I remember it, this guy, and it, it sounds like I make this up. I can't make this up. But I remember the guy saying to me, he said to me, Pastor, he said, if I just had 100, he's a 20-some-year-old 20, 20 year old kid. Uh, Pastor, if I just had $100,000, all my problems would be solved. I remember he said that. I, out of the blue, he said that. I said, and I, I was shocked. I laughed. I said, yeah. I didn't spit on him like that, but <laughs> sorry, brother, sorry, brother Jay. I didn't mean to. Yeah, praise the Lord. Just, like there, there you go. Uh, there you go. It's sort of like sweat, you know, a little bit. Uh, but I, he said, $100,000 will solve all my problems. I said, what would you do with $100,000? By the way, before I go any farther, think about what he said. If I had $100,000, it would solve all my problems. He didn't say a relation with God. He didn't say if I was in the will of God, it would solve my problems. He said, if I had $100,000, it would solve all my problems. What would you do with it? Well, I'd pay off my bills and I'd buy me a nice new truck. That's, that's, that's going to solve all your problems? By the way, that thinking led him to commit armed robbery and be in prison. And not, not long after that. And that's a sad thing. Church guy. Yes, a church guy. Armed robbery, prison. And so who are you choosing to be your God? Are you choosing the God of the Bible or are you choosing uh, the almighty dollar bill? We all have pressures. We all have temptations. We all have struggles dealing with money. It is a reality. You understand that. But what are we looking at? What are we dwelling on? Are we dwelling on, by the way, the Bible? That would be a good thing to dwell on. Are we dwelling on the preaching of God's word? Are we dwelling on the things of God? And that would be important. What are you looking at? Boy, if you're looking at quick, get rich, quick schemes, that will lead you in the wrong direction quick. Who are you choosing to be your God? The God of the Bible or the material of this world? By the way, think about salvation. The answer to heaven is Jesus. We're all sinners. The Bible tells us we're destined to die and go to hell to pay for our sins. But praise God, Jesus paid the price. And we think about it. He was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, rose three days later proving he was God. And our sins have to be paid for. We can pay for them ourselves. The rich man did, amen, but it's in hell. Right. But Jesus paid it. If you call in the name of the Lord, Lord, save me. Not because you're good, not because you get baptized, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Yes. He is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the way to heaven. He is the only hope for heaven. Hey, praise God. Are you saved? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Boy, if you, you are, praise God, then make sure not only you're saved by the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's your answer for everything in life. What will help is God. God will take care 
of you. That's a song. Be not dismayed, whate'er betide. Beneath his wings of love beside, God will take care of you. He will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Oh, Lord, thank you very much. Remember an old preacher, saved, baptized, and the name was Pastor Ferguson. Yeah. Pastor Ferguson, you'd come here on Sunday nights, and he lived for others. He gave his money away. He was happy, always had a smile. Sometimes people in his life did not under, didn't always understand him. How could you be so dedicated to the Word of God? How could you be so dedicated to uh, God's house, church? How could you be so dedicated to live for the Lord? He was happy. And by the way, I remember going and visiting him at his house, and he'd sit in this chair, and he would smile from ear to ear and talk about how good God is. And it's important. Did he waste his life because he didn't have treasure this side of eternity? Did he waste his life because uh, he wasn't as popular as maybe some other people? I don't think so. Uh, he had treasure to look forward to. And imagine that day. He did die. Brother Ferguson died. And imagine when he died. Boop! In heaven. Boy, you can almost hear him sing. It's real, it's real. Oh, I know it's real. Praise God, the doubts are settled. For I know, I know it's real. And he looked down there, and there's Jesus. Immediately, he bows his knee to the King of kings and Lord of lords, takes his crown, casts it before the Lord Jesus Christ, see, you almost see Jesus say, hey, Preacher Ferguson, come here, I want to show you something. He walks him down this lane to the biggest mansion, better than any mansion this side of eternity. So, Brother Ferguson, woo, look what I have for you. And by the way, was he smart for laying up treasures in heaven? Yes. yes but you have a choice too. Where are you laying up your treasures, here on earth or up in heaven? By the way, I'm going to end cats and rats. That's not even a good treasure anyway. That's a mess. Treasure in heaven, that's good. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you.